Um, so I'm going to um, try to tell you a story about, um, a, a, I think, a common problem that we're experiencing more and more, and take you through the story um, as an example of the problem of scarcity or the problem of resource extraction and how we often don't think about resources um, in the full complex way in which the, the, with the same complexity that the problems we're facing uh, demands and at the same time to try to identify strategies that may help to overcome uh, this common problem. I'm, I've, one of my interests for a long time is on the possibility of what I call disruptive insight and how the methodologies of science can bring to the practices of art a disruptive insight, uh, but also how artistic practices can bring to the methodologies of science the same kind of disruption and how those two lateral forms of disruption are often very productive. Um, and I can talk a little bit about how I did that, particularly through resonances. But I want to take you through this argument because it's something that has been bothering me for quite a long time. I basically spent, like a lot of you, uh, my time thinking obsessively about two or three ideas, I would imagine. Uh, one of them is the ethics um, of AI. Um, the second is the question of affect, or how human emotion is responding to technological change. And in particular, uh, this question, which I call the kind of closing of the commons. So. It, it occurred to me that there's this um, ritual that still persists, which is very strange, which is to cover something up with a black cloth and then to very ceremoniously uncover it. Right? This, we do this all the time. Um, and it, this happens in public space. And it occurred to me that what this was, what this was the birth of something from its sort of material life, from its existence as a thing, to its public life. Right? It was a sort of gift that was being given. And so it had to be, because this was a symbolic transformation, it had to be ritualized. Right? So what this ritual means is that there is a unveiling of something. Right? It, that something is brought into light. And it's brought into the light of the public realm. It leaves from the artist's studio, from the people who commissioned it, into our common shared world. Right. And what happens in this transition is actually a precise transformation that is not material. So nothing materially changes, right? but yet something ethical, emotional, social happens in this transformation. What I've noticed in the last five to seven years is the fact that there's a counter movement. There's a kind of pathology of closure that happens. So what we can track in the last few years is um, an attempt, whether conscious or unconscious, economic, material, et cetera, to close off these spaces, not only physically, but in terms of the content that can be shown in those spaces. Okay? And these pathologies of closure will, seem, will start to sound more and more familiar too. And I want to suggest that this public life, or this, what I would call this publicness of the commons, which hopefully by the end of this will make more sense to you, that this publicness is being threatened, and in particular, that it's Precarious in the sense that what we can see, what we can hear, what we can feel, what we can share, what we can produce in public space is actually under attack. And the question of public space itself is being extracted from social space and it's being extracted from us, just like every other resource is being extracted. Okay? But we don't pay as much attention to it because it isn't physical in that sense that maybe water is physical or sunlight is physical. Okay. I'm not creating a hierarchy of needs. I'm simply saying there's, a, there's an extraction of this resource, and it is limited, just like all the other resources. What, if you think about the human sensorium and what we are able to feel and share and act in common, right? um, the restrictions are not only psychological or imaginary, but the way we organize ourselves, we organize our life, but they're also legal ethical and political, which means that it's a problem that needs a, a variety of solutions. And what the, the inverse of this, what happens in, uh, in contrast is spaces of invisibility, right? which politically speaking is a problem. So for, all, for example, you have years and years of underdevelopment and all of a sudden the invisible subject appears at our, at our doorstep, 
as if it wasn't, they weren't always there. So populism is an example of one. The, the, the migrant is an example. There's another example, right? So spaces of invisibility begin to dominate spaces of publicness. They're, they're, they're in the sense that they're diametrically opposed. Um, or they're deemed part of some kind of imaginary threat. Right? You invent a kind of terror-filled threat that limits public space, whether it's congregation or whether it's whatever it might be, uh, any kind of action or movement or expression. Um, and so I want to suggest that the shared space that we all want to work and believe in is actually incredibly precarious. It is a space of collective imagining where publicness is not assured. So we should not take it as a given that this commons, which is the resources that we use to create this public space, is assured. It is in no way assured. And in fact, it's insidiously being um, uh, attacked. And in fact, it can be very easily be taken away. So you can take sledgehammers to thousands of years of human culture. It's very easy to do. We have many examples around the world, starting more or less with the, Buddha, uh, the, the, the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan. And you have examples of literal violence, so iconoclasm, uh, artists being jailed, uh, biennials that happen in, world, in countries that are, have, are, are, are notorious for human rights violations, right, which seems to be a, a contradiction. Um, and in fact, uh, digital forms of that censorship. So Facebook will, it will, will remove images that it finds offensive from our shared public space, right? which we are also extracting from a multinational company. Right? So we're, and I'll sketch this out a little bit about how we, in a sense, we siphon off the commons instead of actually having those resources that are at our disposal. Um, so there are countless examples you can trace far-right attacks throughout. I mean, this is all familiar to you. I'm sure you, you're, you're relatively familiar with these cases. For me, the most egregious one is the Israeli cultural minister uh, deciding that there should be a loyalty test um, for every single artist that gets government funding from the Israeli government. Loyalty test. It's just, it's, I mean, I'm sure someone will pass it. <laughs> This is a little bit similar to, um, for example, citizenship tests. So uh, there's all these NGOs that do these, this rhetorical exercise where they give residency um, tests to residents of countries. So language proficiency tests, history proficiency tests that are given to migrants or immigrants, and most of the residents fail those tests, right? Because they're made to be failed, right? They're, they're made, no one should be able to pass those tests because that's also a form of, of inclusion. Um, or for example, things like no platforming. Right, which is the sort of progress, do you know what no platforming is? So no, no platforming is a phenomenon uh, of, say you, you're on a university campus and someone comes to that campus that has what you would consider contrary views to your community, you simply shut them out and you prevent them from entering the space in which they will be speaking. Right, which is the progressive liberal version of the problem. Right, it's saying we don't agree with your opinion so you shouldn't come here to speak. I intuitively believe that that is a good strategy because I don't want to hear the drivel of some right-wing nut, but I understand how that feeds into this larger pathology. So there are many, many, many examples of this veiling, of this closing up. Um, and it, it's really a closing up of, of what could be enacted as speech, what could be enacted as action, what could be enacted in this common shared space. Um, and it, it, in its extreme form, it ends in iconoclasm. So we actually live in an iconoclastic society. It doesn't seem like it at first because we're so visually oriented. Even though percentage-wise, most of our communication is done through texts, we like to think that we live in a visual culture. It's a visual culture that's largely iconoclastic, not actually iconophilic. Right? Even though we take endless selfies of ourselves, um, there is a kind of violence that's also directed at the level of the image, which is, which is I think, part of this pathology. Um, and you could look at um, other forms, so close, pathologies of closing, Brexit, is, a, is, is part of that pathology. Um, Donald Trump's fantastically obscene proposal for a wall is a, is a, it's a, it's a simplistic solution to a hyper-complex problem, which is dealt with in the simplest form possible, which is always closing, right? Pathologies of closing. Um, so this fencing off is part of this. Um, there's also really interesting examples, like, um, uh, like the, uh, the bans on Muslim veils. Right? Do you're familiar that there's all these instances, which is really funny, right? So this is totally acceptable, but yet the veiling of a Muslim woman is a problem. Now there's, a, there's an issue with veiling, uh, and it's interesting that veiling is so frightening to uh, liberal European societies. And veiling is very, 
complex because one, the faciality and the, and the presence of the face is intimately tied with political discourse. We have, we have to look at each other and be able to talk. But in fact, in, in, um, in, in communities in which uh, veiling is part of social life, it's actually the only form that women can enter into public space. So there's two problems there, right? One is the fact that in public space you cannot wear a veil, which is already a kind of limitation of what can happen in the space, but actually it restricts women from public space because they can only enter public space when they are veiled. Right? So it's got a double violence. You can argue whether that's acceptable or good or not. It's just a, a social dynamic that exists for, for women in Muslim communities to enter public space, they are veiled. Right? So it restricts yet another subject from appearing in public space. Um, this is really important because this idea is central not only to civil society and art, but it's, it's actually intrinsic to almost everything we do or think about in terms of how we want society to function. And in fact, it's in, it, it intrinsically ties civil society with culture. Right? The two are intimately connected in the sense that the fate of one is tied to the other. Because what happens in public concerns us as much as citizens or as spectators, as practitioners. It, it actually is physically um, the transition from being one subject to another subject happens seamlessly in, as you move from external space to internal space, right? And then all the behavioral patterns and behavioral rhetorics that are applied in each space is what becomes interesting. So you commune in, in public space by sitting down, and you don't commune in cultural space by standing up, right? Um, so th the, the way these spaces are organized is kind of these spatial politics are very important. And it, but at the same time, it becomes a common responsibility because it's a shared space of acting. Right? So it, it's also something that unites a variety of disciplines. Um, and it I think it invites, what I want to suggest to you, it invites a caring for and defending of this public space. So we have to be concerned and care for these spaces. And this is actually, uh, historically, in terms of etymology, the, the origin of curating is caring. Curare means to care for. And so the idea is the curator is the person who cared for public works. So sewage, anything that was a common good was the charge of someone who cared for that charge. And that's where actually curator originates from. And I uh, uh, personally have, have sort of come to see my work as caring for the public life of the imagination. I give absolutely no value um, to, the, to any, in a sense, creativity only exists if it's public. Right. To me, the imagination has to be made public. It, it has inherent publicness in it, um, which makes it thrive and it actually is central to human flourishing. And I'll explain what happens when it isn't public to show you how, how devastating that effect actually is. And so, um, and, and that all of this should take place in the light and visibility of public space. So we should look at it as a form of, of extraction. Um, iconoclasm, nativist, xenophobic, and populist movements, as well as the dwindling number of sites and places in which to act or enact participation or collective action. So this is sort of the pattern that's happening over a period of years. The reason this is important is because we are facing more and more um, these enclosures are coming at the same time as we have hyper-complex problems um, that invite very, very simple solutions. Uh, sci scientific methodologies are a little bit better at dealing with complexity. That there's, there's a whole order of complexity. There's a whole methodology of complexity. But culture is very bad. In fact, it, m most of the time, it's actually very good at uh, simplifying right? and normalizing. So it's very good at taking a very complex problem and normalizing it into something very, very simple. And part of that pattern of normalization is, for example, um, this, this general feeling um, that things used to be better. Like the world is very complex, it used to be simpler. It was simpler when there were only two genders, uh, as if that existed, or it was simpler. You know, th one particular country was better off until this right-wing nut came in, but it, there was a whole historical process that led to that person arriving. Any kind of normalization. Now, these normalizations happen in public space, and we're very good at thinking about um, these things in very black and white terms. So, for example, we, I am personally very confused about fact and fiction these days. Right? Um, it's very hard. That, that intuitive feeling of what is true um, doesn't really work anymore. Right? So we have all kinds of all, you know, these, this wonderful nominalist 
conception of alternative facts, right? multi-perspectival views on what is true or what is not. And that personal conviction and opinion, in a sense, value more than uh, science or, or some kind of literacy that brings you a different understanding. Part of this is also technological in the fact that uh, common forms of visual literacy, now one of the things that we should be very good at doing is being visually literate, right? We're actually, are, we're very bad at doing that. Evolutionarily speaking, we're very bad um, because we have, a, we have a one basic problem which I'll demonstrate to you. But also because technology is arriving at a point where it, it can create things that mirror more or less things that were true. So things like deep fakes, which I, I don't know if you're familiar with, right? So you can actually model um, someone's face and actions and produce something which looks like is something that that person said. Or in fact, you can take a still image and from that still image make a motion capture or, or animate that picture so the Mona Lisa can actually look at you and smile or frown. Um, and you could create from paintings, you can create entire sort of sequences of movement. Right? This complicates our sense of that the visual was at least one perceptive mechanism of certainty. Um, well, why, all, why, is this all, why is this all relevant? Um, it's relevant because so many of the contemporary problems we have today deal with these enclosures. And these enclosures are more and more part of our contemporary life, right? Because they give us conflicting and opposing data. They give us conflicting and opposing ideas. They give us conflicting and opposing narratives. But the question of this publicness of, uh, and this, this question of the publicity of imagination is very important, particularly when, if, when the present seems very unruly and it seems very contradictory and it seems very confusing. Um, and where certainties are very comforting and very clear. Right? You can identify a common enemy, you can identify a common narrative, you can say, this is what's mostly the problem, we need to solve it in this very simplistic way. Um, and so we adjust to a kind of new normal in which we make do with some kind of alteration to that dynamic. The publicness dynamic is very um, complex because the question is, it's, it's not only a political and moral problem, it's actually something that's central to human flourishing. Right? Because being able to imagine something that doesn't exist and then materialize it in front of you and share it with someone else is pretty fundamental to, human, to what is human. At least, it's at the very border of what makes humans distinct from any other species. Right? This has been central to human flourishing as long as there have been humans on Earth. And this impulse to do this is not a private impulse. It's a public impulse. So you can either leave a handprint. There's a school of debate whether this is a, a negative image or a positive image. But in any case, uh, you can leave a register of yourself in this space, which was common space. Or you can imagine something that never existed before and give it form and give it shape, extracting the resources around you to create something entirely new, which doesn't come from any analog um, or any experience that isn't a cognitive, emotional, and ultimately probably a spiritual one, right? or at least a metaphysical one. So the question is, how can this storytelling, how could this imagination, how could this culture exist if it's not public? And if it is public, how can it aid us in creating new kinds of proof, new kinds of evidence, new, new solutions to problems, right? Um, new methodologies for thinking about the complexity of the present. We're very used to thinking about resource extraction in very simple ways. But for example, one of the things that humans do that we're very good and very bad at doing is we're very good at seeing a face in an electrical outlet. Very good at doing that. You cannot see that, right? Um, and we're very good at sort of being able to see in an entire leaf a kind of amalgam of nature. And this is very problematic because this is also the kind of pattern thinking that leads you to not see certain patterns. And at the same time, this is what creates um, a kind of tension between us and technology, because um, this, is, this gives rise to everything from the most important insights in the history of science and total paranoia. Right? From this derives this, this double function of the cognitive. In fact, AI is very good at processing these kind of data sets, and it's very bad at doing what we do very, very well. And of course, artworks participate in this, in this complex um, 
in this complex economy. So I want you to hold this idea in your head, that, that if you think about normal resources like water and light, water and light are more or less the two mediums of contemporaneity. So they're, what, the flows of contemporary life kind of pass through water or light. Ports, shipping, fiber optic cables, data, information. Right? So those resources are fundamental. But this other resource that's underlying is the, the water has to pass through somewhere, the fiber optic cables have to hit somewhere. right? So have you ever seen the building where the fiber optic cables enter major cities? It's, it's, it's extraordinary. You should Google this. So there's these monoliths inside urban centers where literally the cables come up from the earth. Right? And that is a prime resource center because that's where massive amounts of of cooling needs to happen. So these are major extraction centers of, of energy. But this culture also participates in, in that extraction. Um, it seems strange to be talking about this, you know, if we, if we argue that this power of our, of our oversized brain lets us find these patterns and create these things in public space. And if these spaces, we have to be concerned with the spaces in which this happened as much as we may be concerned with all these other resources. So in the space in which this happens seems to us at least, or it seems to me, um, there's a kind of contradiction, there's a certain irony, um, because it's very public, right? I mean, contemporary art is sexy, right? There's a reason why this, you add culture and art to the end of anything now. Because you can get money for it, it's very exciting. You know, it's, look, it's Jay-Z, this is very cool. Um, but in fact, the irony is that, that it's suffering as much from the same dynamics. It only appears to be uh, protected. Particularly because if you think about public space as a space, or publicness as where we might be confronted with these fictions, this is thinking in a, broader, in a broader sense of the imagination where the space in which we can share fictions in the companies of others. It's also a space in which you could say that the stirrings of the human heart or the stirrings of, the, of human consciousness meet the raising of the fist. It's where those two emotions connect. And it's also where human expression, and in particular where the sense of communication, social cohesion happen, but yet it's being mediated by counter technologies of enclosure, right? Which looks something like this, right? So there's now a kind of mediating element in public space where almost, no matter where you go, almost the first thing that somebody does is actually not stop and look, it's to do that. Um, So how does the network create a shared space worldwide? Right? The internet is a sort of common shared global point. Right? It is a public space in the sense that it unites. Just like, what, think about water and light. Water connected populations through ports and shipping. Light connects us through these networks. How is it that these networks are in effect isolating networks? Because what the, their function is more about making public private affect. right? So it's private life made public. It's not public life. If you think about the, great, the, the events that bring people together, um, what are they, for example? What are, what are the sort of common shared events that seem to uh, put themselves into the sort of larger cultural imagination? They tend to be natural disasters, um, some kind of scandal, or we've invented a really wonderful name for this, going viral. Right? This is, what, is, this is be what becomes shared as a common reference. In fact, this is amazing because we're in an allegorical space. This used to be the common shared narrative for many, many people, right? The allegorical sense, and it's, non, it's visual in the sense it's non-textual. In fact, the great debate in, in Roman Catholic, or in particular Christian religions, was precisely access to the written word as opposed to something like stained glass. Um, so there's another kind of enclosure, which I would say is... Uh, the ethical position of distancing. So we are mostly witnesses, right? We have this mediating element through which we stand back from what happens in public life. So the reversal is we take pictures of ourselves this way, and we take pictures of the world this way, right? That inversion is, is actually an inversion of private to public. So we intimately put ourselves into a loop, 
taking the image. We only need ourselves, right? And then we reverse that to take pictures of something in public space. And if you, if you think about when that camera is reversed, it's reversed in a mirror, <laughs> right? So the sense that when you are in public space or space that is shared with others, it, there's a distancing effect that's all, that we've also become uh, very acclimated with. And in fact, what you find is there are instances, I know, I'm going to go over. That's just the way it's going to be. It's not going to be too, it's not going to be too much, but um, <laughs> there's a sense in which this is all related to crimes and violence. So in fact, this is non, this mediation is about not doing something. It's about when something is happening, you do not involve yourself. Okay? This is central because it means not sharing that space. Palmyra is a great example, right? Common shared World Heritage Site. 18,000-year-old um, arch, gone. Right. Why is it attacked? It's attacked because it's a public space. It's attacked because who, the, the people who blew it up knew they would not be attacked by any government. It, you would, the, no one in their right mind would bomb this site. And they only bombed it after the arch was destroyed. Right? So somebody figured out that this publicness question is actually very, very important. And then they recreated it using uh, 3D rendering. They recreated the arch in another public square in London. Right? So this transference of public space is really interesting. So have we lost something in this, in this, in this transference? There's also a weird, the public life of things is also very strange these days. This is a, a painting by Caravaggio. I'm rushing. There's a painting by Caravaggio which only exists as a copy. This painting does not physically exist in the world. It was destroyed during World War II. Um, and so you have all these copies of it which no one's taking care of, right? Because it's just copies and copies and copies of objects. Um, we also have another problem which is that we're very bad at dealing with these things because we don't understand um, the results. So there's a goal versus outcome problem that AI is teaching us. And this is basically the difference between what you intend the AI to do and what it actually does. So when you give it a complex problem like playing a game, like Tetris, it actually figures out that if you pause it, you can't lose. So that's a viable outcome. But it's not what we want, actually want it to do. We're also guilty of this kind of violence because we break up things on YouTube. Not much different, if you think about it morphologically, it's not much different from going into a church and knocking off the faces off the sculptures. We just do this, it just doesn't seem as violent. But in fact, it's the same kind of gesture. You take the integrity of a work and you break it up into pieces. We also do it through JPEG. So JPEG is the most common technology for sharing images. We like, we share, this is how we express public sentiment. We like, we share, this is our participation in public space. It's like a form of voting, right? Um, this, this compression is actually um, iconoclastic because it adds, um, it adds an artifact to the image. It destroys it by, by pixelating it. And then if you've ever seen an, an interview with someone who wants to hide their face, what do they do? They pixelate it, right? So these, these connections are there. The visual culture tells us. And then you have more egregious examples, like um, this very outdated. I think also, like, bigotry is also very, very outdated. It's sort of boring. Like, there, has, there needs to be like a software update on, on bigotry, because it's so stupid. It's like anti-Jewish graffiti on a sculpture in Versailles. It's so dumb. Um, but what, what Anish Kapoor decided to do, which I think is really, so they, uh, what do they do? They veiled it. Like, this is Europe, so what do we do? We veil it, we put a black, I mean, like this, it, there's an imaginary here that's being played out, right? You cover it with the face, that you, with the veil that you cover a Muslim woman. And what Anish Kapoor decided to do is said, no, 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 don't erase it, don't do anything, keep it as it is, because I want this to be available for all to see, right? That's the gesture I'm talking about. We may be tempted to remove this, but he said, no, 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 no. You have to include it, because this is what public space is about. Ostensibly, this is what Hannah Arendt was saying. Uh, we don't have to get so academic about it. The origins of the, muse the, origins of the museum is, is precisely as a space like this. Right? It's important to remember that the Capitolino, when it was founded, for example, the first museums in Europe, this was their function. Public spaces of sharing. Right? And in fact, if you look at old paintings of what people did in museums, it looks nothing like what people do in museums now. Right? This guy is admiring the bust of the author he's reading. There's a couple or th three couples here engaging in some kind of discourse. 
there's copying. It, it's just a, so, it's a social space. Imaginary as it is, this is a plan for the refurbishing um, of the Louvre. Uh, imaginary as it is, it was conceived as a public space. This is what art looks like now, the Freeport. This is where art, when, when, when collectors buy art, this is where they put it. So even the market dynamics of the contemporary art market are a problem because everything moves into the pub, in the private sector, private sector invis invisibility. So the more, so there's an inverse curve between the more successful the art market is, the less publicness and visibility there actually is. Um, there's also another problem. So what you're looking at is a capture of the amount of time that people spend in front of the greatest artworks of all time. So Mona Lisa at the Louvre, for example. Um, does this seem an adequate amount of time for the veneration that we give these objects? It seems very, very little. <laughs> so even the public life of these things is being contracted and restricted. Right? Just the amount of time that these things take up is being limited. And again, right, this is the experience. I want to share with you how weird this actually is. This is a narrative from a, tr a German traveler in 1786, Sophie de la Roche. This is what she said about visiting an early museum in Europe. W with what sensations one handles a Carthaginian helmet excavated near Capua, household utensils from Herculaneum. There are mirrors too belonging to Roman matrons. With one of these mirrors in my hand, I looked among the urns, nor could I restrain my desire to touch the ashes of an urn on which a female figure is being mourned. So touch. Was an, was an important part of this encounter. So the touch has been removed from the experience of culture. Yet another enclosure, right? So this, seems, this might seem really stupid, but here's, we do this every single day. This is how we, right? So just a quick survey. How many people have a smartphone? How many people have read the manual to a smartphone? How did you learn how to do that? How did you learn this dance? This is. Right? This is choreography that you've learned. You've adapted to this. Right? Yet you, would, you accept it in this space. Right? Yet another kind of enclosure. And then there are all these enclosures in public space. Like you can't, there's things you cannot do. Right? There's things you can do. And this is, I'm going to end here. So do you know what desire lines are? Right? Yes? No? no? OK. So, um, in urban planning, when someone designs this brilliant person who designed this park on this college campus, actually intended that everyone would walk around the perimeter to get to the other side. What do people actually do? It's brilliant, right? So these are desire lines. Yeah. It's, it's a fantastic way that we respond to restrictions of public space. So how do we create desire lines through these problems? Right. Physical, emotional, conceptual, creative. Here's one. So this cup of coffee is really, really important. There's a whole history of globalization in this, in this image here. But particularly important is we use small acts of consumption to transform private space into public space. The minimum unit of consumption worldwide all, in almost every city, European capital, global, whatever, is coffee. It's not water. It's coffee. Right? It's the smallest unit of, of consumption from private space to public space. You get to a cafe, you take a little table, you pay your 70 cents, whatever it is, and all of a sudden you have, you can meet with your friends, you can work, right? You can do this, well, you can do this. Um, and this active conception, there's actually a name for this, it's rental in perpetuity, it's how we siphon off, we transform private. So this is a desire line that, that capital is constructed for us. We do this without thinking. If you think about this, invert, if you think about this, always think of the dialectic. This is the dialectic. So being prepared for the coming resource apocalypse by the string of survivalist shows that are not very popular, like Naked and Afraid. This is my favorite. <laughs> this is basic human emotions. Um, I have to say, most of the times I've been naked, I have not been afraid. I have never been afraid while being naked. And this is the, this is the inverse um, uh, option, which is the ultimate dream of luxury is what? Space, private space, being alone. Like the ultimate luxury, fantasy luxury is space, right? Private space. So we have to also think about that. And this is how we actually work, right? 
a domestic units of individual private space, sharing public space through uh, acts of consumption. This is what it looks like in a museum. This is the difference between publicity and private space, right? You see the, the rhetorics are very, very different. The valuation is very, very different, right? I'm going to leave you with two examples, just to close. It's th three minutes. Harnessing public space is incredibly powerful. I'm going to give you an idea, so it's not very, so it's not abstract. So this is a project by a group of, um, of artists, architects, curators, researchers in London called Forensic Architecture. So what they did is they took the bombing of the city, and they took all the public data that was available from that bombing, cell phone pictures, um, any, anything that was freely available through social networks, and they mapped those photographs. So someone here takes an image of this cloud, someone here takes an image of this cloud, someone here takes an image of this cloud, but then there's someone here that takes the same image, right? What they do is they take all this data, composite it together, and from freely available public data, cell phone pictures, Twitter, um, uh, loads, whatever it is, can recreate what supposedly never happened, which is the bombing of the city. And they can map it to the extent where they can tell the time of day by the position of the sun, because you have multiple reference points, uh, the load of the bomb to prove if it was a munition that's within or without uh, standards of regulations for, for bombing. I, I know that sounds horrible, but it, it does exist. Um, in fact, the, the, the training device, or well, the training program uh, for bombardments for a long time was called um, bug splat. Because um, when you bomb someone aerially, um, the, when, they, when they are uh, obliterated, they look like a, an insect being smashed. Um, so that's another type of normalization. And so what this means is that you can harness all the stuff that's public that seems meaningless, and in fact use this to prove that this bombing happened in a court of law. It's incredibly powerful to think, and it, it, you can only do this through the ingenuity of engineers, scientists, computer scientists, and artists working together. It's, it's, it's an, un, a, an unbelievable resource if you know how to map and how to use it. I'm gonna give you the opposite example, which is um, this writer named Daniel Harms, and this is what I'm ending with. So I know I've already gone over time. In the 1920s, Daniel Harms was an um, illustrator, an no, avant-garde theater director, very, very well-regarded. He wrote beautiful children's books, which you could not find anymore. He was part of the Russian avant-garde, fell out of favor in the 1920s. He was marked as an anti-Soviet writer, so he couldn't find any work. He couldn't even make children's books. Um, and so he began to write, as the Russians say, for the drawer. This also happened to um, Shostakovich, um, after the, um, the premiere of Lady Macbeth. So in the 1940s, Shostakovich begins to write the string quartets, which are basically private um, compositions. And he, Daniel Harms basically died of starvation, poverty. He was interned in a psychiatric hospital and died just absolutely miserable. And he wrote a, a short story. It's very short, it's a, it's a paragraph. In 1937, in a notebook, which was only published after he passed away which is called The Red-Headed Man. So I'm going to read that story to you. There lived a red-headed man who had no eyes or ears. He didn't have hair either. So he was called the redhead arbitrarily. He couldn't talk because he had no mouth. He had no nose either. He didn't have arms or legs. He had no stomach. He had no back. He had no spine. He had nothing inside at all. He didn't have anything, so we don't even know who we're talking about. It's better that we don't talk about him anymore. Right? So this world of this red-headed man, the world of harm's imagination, was tucked away in this drawer and effectively stopped existing. Right? And this might seem silly, but the spaces in which we act and we think and we dream together are actually spaces that are this vulnerable. That, you know, sometimes we don't even know what we're talking about anymore, but yet that red-headed man still wants to be somewhere. And I think that we have to be aware of how we can find solutions precisely to let him appear. Sorry for going over. We don't take questions, we take questions.
test for arts. Yes. Um, and so, can you hear me? You can hear me fine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I know that a lot of there are openness initiatives, especially in Europe and the U.S. right now for science as well. Yes. Um, that are kind of responding to this idea that if you're receiving public funds, you need to put your work out there for people to see. And obviously, Open Hub is responding to some of that, but there are different ideas of what openness actually means. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about this idea of the conflict between having democratically dispersed knowledge and values that are kind of make, that are influencing the decisions of what gets funded, but still need to preserve that kind of inspirational imaginary that may conflict with these populist public ideas. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Uh, it's not easy to uh, to parse out all those aspects. Um, so. The, the question of public money is always a really complex one. And the, the, the outcome question is also really difficult because some of the, some of the really interesting research-based things shouldn't have necessarily a public outcome. We want to preserve some space in which that can happen. The question is not so much whether the, um, the outcome is itself public. It's whether, um, for example, the criteria that, that is used to judge the outcomes or the criteria that's used to judge the project, if it's in conflict with that oriented goal. Right? And, and often what research can get into is, first of all, there's, there's the classic problem of silos. right? So everyone just kind of keeps to their, which is something I face. So I, for four years, I was in charge of uh, an exhibition space at MIT and did residencies, organized with, with the team. I was the curator of the space and organized with the team a series of residencies. And our biggest problem, so these are all labs that are getting public and private funding, government funding. MIT is, is, is very well funded uh, also by, um, not only by pharmaceutical companies, but by um, the government. And, um, and one of the things we did was put artists in labs. And the research of those labs often was very closed in the sense that it was, the metrics were very specific to those labs, the funding was very directed towards a specific outcome, there were all kinds of reports that you would fill out, you know, and I don't, you know, those of us who do funding uh, reports for, or funding applications, for arts funding, it's very funny, you say like, what, you know, what are the variables that you would use to evaluate this project, and it's like, well, if Peter likes it, you know, there's, <laughs> like, how do you find a metric that, that, that works that way? So what we had to do, was to go to those labs, Aero Astro, for example, and say, you're working on this, this PhD student is working on this particular problem. What we can do is create visibility for that very specific, slightly closed off question. And we can bring to that question a much larger context and create a, some visibility for that. Right? So that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is, in fact, the spaces in which this funding is going to or toward and how that's applied to questions of sort of publicity or public comments. For example, questions like um, IP problems come into play, which is a huge issue, which I didn't even raise. Um, and how does IP relate to innovation? Right? It's, a huge, it's actually a major, major issue because we know it's a catalyst for um, rapid innovation. Um, resource management in that sense. But I, I don't think I'm getting to the core of the question that you want to ask. Am I? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can tell by your face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just rephrase your question so I could be more useful. Well, think of it this way. Let me, let, me give you, let me give you an operative analogy. So, think about the same person, you, me. I don't know, you're, you're definitely more intelligent than I. So me, I go into a national park, or, a, or a, let's say a botanical garden, right? And literally, me going into a botanical garden is like somebody going to a museum and all the paintings are turned facing the wall. Because I don't know the Latin name, any of this stuff. I don't know it. I can't identify it. It's just a beautiful landscape. It's just charming, wonderful colors. 
That kind of literacy is not, it's only different in degree from the literacy that happens when you go into a museum, for example. When you go into a museum, you have to know the Latin names of the plants, right? That's why everybody's always looking at the labels. Like, who did this? What is this? What is the meaning of this? So what if you, as an exercise, did, an, did an, a complete inversion where you treat a museum like a total landscape? You don't have to know anything. There's no culture here. It's just, you just enjoy it. And you actually treat nature through those kinds of, of forms of literacy, right? So that's, instead of, you have to be a little bit careful about this privileging that we give, for example, to artists in the sense that if you just stick an artist at a problem, like it'll get solved. I think that's a little bit precarious because it, it, D, it, it, it takes the responsibility away from a lot of the social agents. So if you throw artists at a municipal problem, you're basically saying, well, we don't need urban planners. <laughs> you don't, right? So I'm, I'm a little, I think that there's a, there has to be a methodology of working together and privileging those two points. And I think one of them is precisely this question of literacy. There's a literacy problem in the sciences, no doubt. Common literacy, like pop, pop. In popular science, you think that you think that the. Okay, because in my experience, I find that people are not very um, literate, so scientifically literate, basic things like we have. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but like, there are the percentage of flat earthers at this moment is very high. It shouldn't be as high as it is. Like that to me is a problem. Just like I think there's a cultural problem in which there's a passivity, there's a spectatorship. There's a sense that th if you think about what those two media are supposed to do, one has been closed off into the arena of affect and one has been closed off into the arena of knowledge. And I think that there needs to be a little bit of a, a kind of dynamic change. Right, and that, that they're knowledge-based practices that can inform laterally each one. I found it to be very productive when, when putting together artists and labs, that in fact those points of connectivity were not about understanding what the lab was doing in that sense, but it was about how the disruption was mutually beneficial. Not just artists using machines, and not just visualizations of scientific information, which are the two default positions, right? My electron microscopy images, or um, like formulas written on a, you know, whatever. Well, a lot of, a lot of this science business is, is, it gets a little confused, but yeah, we will fundamentally disagree then, which is good, that's good. literate are we when we look, uh, go around this church? What do we know about all the images in this church? We're completely illiterate, most of us. So it's not only, only the yeah. science that we're illiterate, we're a little bit about nature, a little bit about art, about culture. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think, I think one, yeah, I tried to, to raise a little bit of this in terms of um, like our ability to to but pattern recognition and our relationship to images being one of both trust in the sense that we communicate with them and we trust them to represent something of ourselves. Uh, simultaneously, our knowledge that we know that they are altered and manipulated. And in fact, our sense that they mediate reality. So the, for example, the space between an event and its image is collapsed now. So things happen, the image of the event is the event, right? They happen in real time. You don't sort of hear about, the space in which you hear about something happening and see the image related to it is, is collapsing, relatively speaking. News is, 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 that space is collapsed. You know, the days when like somebody got killed, there was like the Pope gets shot, that's using the Pope, sorry, it's his house. And the Pope gets shot in Spain and then like the, the photograph has to pass through telegraphically through the ocean and appears in the newspaper the next day. Like that doesn't happen anymore. So we have that relationship, but at the same time, we distrust it because we know it can be manipulated. And in fact, um, we know that like, things like metadata complicate that image, and the fact that every image is more or less an instance of a crime. Like, 
almost every image has additional information that is, is slightly criminal. Do right. you know the movie Blow Up? See that movie? Yeah, that's sort of where images are now, where it, simul it operates on multiple levels. It's like an image of a couple, then it's an image, it's a beautifully framed photographic image, and then if you look closer and you look closer and you look closer and you look closer, oh yeah, of course there's a body, right? Because every image, in a sense, has either someone who's dead, so the majority of people who have been photographed are dead, uh, or it has the, the intimation of some kind of crime, like you take a picture of something, but you didn't involve yourself in that event, right? Like taking a picture of something horrible isn't in essence recriminatory <laughs> because you're, you did not mediate in that. In that. I've, but I think the visual literacy question is one that is, is more easily adaptable because it's more intuitive. So we, you know, the, touch image, the touching of images gives us a relationship with, in which we feel like we have some um, literacy or we have some relationship to it. It's sort of curious because the, all the great utopian projects of the 20th century have, have had a component of, tr of transposing uh, s data, scientific information, the data to visual images. So uh, Vienna School, Otto Neurath in Russia in the 1930s, um, data visualization in, in, your, in, uh, in uh, Western culture, right? This idea of, of visual communication is to, and even the, the stained glass window is an example of transmitting that information. So there's always a sort of utopian idea of, of transferring alpha, alphanumeric information or data to an image. We think we're very, very good at doing this, but in fact, we're, we're, we're not. We were talking about something really interesting, but most people don't know. Um, when you're verifying something online, we were talking about just recently, if we're verifying something online, you know the, 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 the grid module that, that, that happens? Where you have to identify like which image has a, do you know why that exists? Yeah, they're training AIs to recognize the, the, the images. So you're actually inputting data sets when you do that. You're using your amazing visual acumen because you can identify. You know, a three-year-old can tell you what a dog is. And it can also tell you what's close or not a dog, what's related to a dog. It can sort of say, that's a dog, that's not a dog. Um, AI is very bad at doing it. Actually, it's, very, it's, it's relatively bad at doing that statistically. So we're at 60% or something. Um, so that data set is increasing because you're, you're telling it, you're using your visual literacy to tell the AI to do that. I agree, but I think it's, it, I think it's cultural context specific. I don't think it's um, perceptually specific. We don't, just don't know how to read this language anymore because it's outdated. It no longer dominates visual space. We know some of it. We know some of it. I mean, you know, we're relatively familiar with some of it. But it's, 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 um, it's visual culture that doesn't, it doesn't apply to us uh, as much. But visualization is a complex question because it's, it's got a scale problem. How do you visualize things at different scales? And often it's very misleading to people in, in, in general terms. We have time for one more or not? You just want me to if shut up, I'm sure. If someone has a question. I, you want to ask me about Marfa? <laughs> So, hey, hi, uh, very nice talk. I think Thank I, you very much. I think I agree with everything you said, but I just wanted to point out one thing. Sure. Which is there's a lack, I guess, it's not clear to me what, what is then the solution, because I guess, for instance, nowadays we're confronted with, there's this huge public space which came from the 80s that we now call the internet. And the problem with, that I see here, and that is, for me, a paradox is that suddenly we made information super cheap, yeah. right? And making information super cheap and super common, because I guess the internet almost has the potential of infinite me memory. But it's we. Re but it's based on. I don't mean to interrupt, but it's based on resource. Yeah. So I know. You, as long as you can keep cooling it. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's based yeah. on resource. Yeah. yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. But at the same time, we are not. The, that type of machines, right? Yes. We are very good statistical extractors. We, we try to figure out causes and then we try to confirm our own biases and et cetera, et cetera. But when you make the public space with this information so cheap, suddenly expertise is lost and you got, have guys like Trump yeah. just talking about alternative facts. And so my question to you, do you have a guess of how can we solve this paradox? Or? Well, they're, they're, they're different problems. So, um, I, so one of the things I'm very curious is, one of the things I've been working a lot, the, the last lecture I gave was about um, 
the, the, what happens with these, with these changes is a reaffirmation of the human. So with every technological change, we say, sure, no problem, because we still, right? So it's like, oh yeah, they can process all this data, but we still have something special, whatever that thing is, emotion, whatever. You know, a computer can't make the complete, you know, Mozart, whatever. So there's always a, a, a swing back. If you think about nature and culture, there's always a swing back in which somebody, whatever human, whatever technological transformation happens, we then refer, reaffirm something about the human, right? Sociability, some kind of cognitive function, whatever it is. But we're getting to doubt, doubt love, whatever it might be, right? So there's always a quality that we, we keep to ourselves, right? What happens, what's, what's sort of happening is that the technological changes are getting right to the limit. So for example, it becomes like, if you think cognitively speaking, like, like we're not very good patterns. We're actually bad, if you compare it to computational systems, we're bad at sort of finding patterns. Like, it takes us too long, it's just not very useful. But like, what do we do? Like, we're very good at being precognitive, but that's like not very life affirming. Like most of your decisions are based on precognitive processing. You know, like they poll people like, how many decisions do you think you make a day? And they'll say like, you know, 30 or 40, and that's like 300. Or like, they'll do a test, they'll do all these kind of cognitive tests, find out like 98% of your function daily is precognitive. Like, you know what I mean? Like if you move your arm, we were talking about this at dinner. You, guys, you don't believe this at all, but um, if you move your arm, Right? By the time you move your arm, you're not conscious. There's a there's an electrochemical signal that fired off, so the thought of moving your arm is already slightly delayed from the right. You see what I mean? This is all, all almost all of your daily life is precognitive. So you can't establish that. So you get to this point where you've tried really hard to affirm what is distinctly human, right? So that's one problem. The other problem is that, that, that public space is actually privatized space. It's the same as the coffee. It's like you sign up to Facebook, which gives you that platform, but in fact, there's all these other operations that are privatized operations. And you're, you're creating atomistic private spaces in the aggregate are public. But the shared space is usually based on trolls, right? It's, it's the, the public phenomenons are not, we don't, we're not very good at creating this technologically based public platforms. So we have to think about spatial ones, perhaps. So that's one. How do we occupy space in a different way? And then we have to think about things like filter bubbles, right? So the fact that it's not only this, the physical space or the abstract space, it's what goes into that space. So you're limited like I'm limited, like our Facebook feeds. Part of it is, for example, why don't we have another model that isn't the feed model, right? In fact, one of the really interesting models is horrible, which is the, all the right-wing websites like Drudge Report, all that stuff. Have you seen them? They don't use a feed model. So it's really interesting. Like it's almost sometimes, I, I know this is put, putting into blunt terms, like look at what the enemy is doing. Because if you look at all the right-wing sites do not use feed models. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They use an open non-hierarchical model, right? So it's a big, ugly looking site with a bunch of text that you can click on. Whereas the feed model, what it does is it, it reinforces your Right? So your public space is becoming smaller and smaller. It's like, you, if you like this, then you will like that. So that's one. We have to fight those kind of platforms. And then there are, uh, there are other ones that have to do with, um, you know, I'm a big believer in, I think we need to a certain sense socially reorganize. I should say this into the camera. I think we should, we should socially re reorganize. We have to find different collective structures. We actually have to start thinking very seriously about um, like collective ownership, um, collective resource management, deciding that something is in the commons. So stop thinking about private space, stop thinking about public space. Public space meaning like you build, somebody builds a building, then there's a little area out front that everyone can use, but you can't skateboard. You know, like these stupid, dumb ways of doing it. And actually think about, decide that something is in the commons, it's in the common good, and it's not owned by anyone, it's owned by the commons. This is the conservancy logic. And I think we have to think about those, so there's different, different, um, uh, questions. I know we have to go to the next speaker, yeah? Yeah, no, we, we will have to go to a coffee, sure, break. A coffee break. Thank you so much.